Yeah, I'm a geodynamicist, so you'll have to forgive um, any geological terminology inaccuracies. Um, definitely correct me for those. Um, so I guess uh, what I was going to present today is on uh, mountain belts um, in Western Canada. So not the mountain belts that are shown in these two pictures. Uh, this is of course the, uh, Oops, the Andes in South America, um, but that's the only nice mountain belt picture that I had, so that's why I used it. Um, so what I'm going to do is present um, an overview of some of the work that we've been doing um, over the last few years in Western Canada, looking at the transition from the Cordillera to the Craton. Um, so this is work that's been done with a number of different people. Um, I've got a PhD student, Tai Chi Yu, who's um, done some of the work that I'll present today. Um, a former master's student, Deirdre Malion, and an undergraduate student, Ray Wang. Um, and then we've also been collaborating with Martin Unsworth, who's here at the University of Alberta, um, as well as seismologists, uh, Pascal Odette and Andrew Schaefer. Um, so this is the uh, topography for Western Canada, showing that this region um, is really characterized by two distinct areas of topography. On the west, we have the high elevation Cordilleran region, um, which we can see uh, very clearly in the topographic map. And to the east, we have the low-lying craton. Let's see if I can get a pointer working here. Um, so we have the craton in the east, which is very low elevation and low relief. The boundary between these two areas in terms of the topography is the Cordillera deformation front, which we can see nice and clearly um, by the transition here. In terms of the actual geophysical boundary between the Cordillera and Craton, it actually looks like it's a little bit to the west of the deformation front, um, which is the long linear feature that we see in the topography. So in the south, it's uh, the Rocky Mountain Trench, which is kind of this low elevation linear feature. And as we move to the north, that seems to merge in with the Tintina Fault. Um, so as I'll show, uh, we've got uh, geophysical data um, that seems to uh, mark those as being the boundary between the Cordilleran region and the Craton region. The other thing that's shown on this map are uh, red triangles. These are recent volcanics. This is not a complete set um, in the south, uh, but in the north, this is fairly complete. And what you'll notice is the Cordilleran region is characterized by quite a lot of magnetism. In the south, many of these volcanoes are arc volcanoes associated with the Cascadia subduction zone. There are some um, more inland volcanoes that might be associated with a slab edge or a hot spot, or perhaps some of the mantle dynamics that I'll be showing a little bit later. As we go to the north, um, this is the Northern Cordillera Volcanic Province. This is not subduction related. And towards the end of the talk, we'll come back to that and uh, discuss uh, some of the ideas for how that is being formed. Uh, this is now a map that shows the seismic shear wave velocity from Andrew Schaefer's uh, surface wave model. Um, the different colors show the relative wave speeds. The blacks and the reds are areas where the shear wave speed is fairly low, and I should have said that this is at 100 kilometers depth. So you'll notice that the Cordilleran region is characterized by low mantle seismic velocities. Further to the east, we see the Craton very clearly as an area of high seismic velocity. And you'll notice that the transition from low to high, in the south especially, underlies the Rocky Mountain Trench. As we move to the north, it becomes a little bit less. But nonetheless, you notice that there is a transition that's happening somewhere between the Tintina Fault and the Cordillera Deformation Front. Based on this, uh, Andrew Schaefer has an estimate of the lithosphere thickness. And that's what's shown here. This is basically just the depth to the plus 2% velocity contour. Um, and this very nicely illustrates that the, uh, the velocity structure maps to very clear variations in lithosphere thickness. The hot Cordillan mantle coincides or leads to uh, the inference of a very thin lithosphere, where the thickness, according to this color scale, is much less than 100 kilometers. As we move to the east, you notice a very sharp increase in lithosphere thickness to the craton, where the thicknesses are 200 kilometers or more. Basically, we have a very sharp step in lithosphere thickness as we go from the Cordillera to the craton. Um, so this has been something that's been of great interest to me um, in 
of my PhD days, really. Um, this is now some cross section going through Andrew's uh, shear wave model. So we've got A, B, C, D, and that's going from the north to the south. And again, these just illustrate that we have the sharp contrast between the low velocity Cordillera and high velocity Craton. And you can see that this is a really sharp contrast. If we especially look in the south, which is where we're going to focus on for the first bit, um, you'll notice that there is a sharp boundary. And it looks like our boundary is dipping towards the west. We'll look at this in a little bit more detail uh, shortly. So from the uh, seismic studies, we can see that the Cordilleran mantle looks very different than the Cretonic mantle. And we have this um, boundary between them that underlies the Rocky Mountain Trench. There's of course been a number of other uh, geophysical studies that have uh, been conducted over this area, so things like surface heat flow. And what I'll do in the next slide is magnetotellurics. So this will be a magnetotelluric profile along this line through the Southern Cordillera. Um, so this is now the profile going from kind of the Southwest to the Northeast. And the different colors give us the electrical resistivity of the subsurface. The red colors are low resistivity or high conductivity. At shallow depths, this is the resistivity within the crust. You'll notice that we've got these pockets of very low resistivity in the Cordilleran crust. These are interpreted to be uh, some kind of fluid signature, perhaps sand fluids or perhaps partial melt. What I want to focus on is the mantle structure. And what we see is that the very clear contrast between the Cordillera and mantle, which has low resistivities, or uh, another way of saying that is that it's highly conductive, compared to the Cretonic mantle, which has much higher resistivity or lower conductivity. There's been a number of studies to understand the origin of these electrical um, values. Uh, Dennis Ripa's study in 2013 took a careful analysis and what he showed is that in the mantle below the Cordillera, these low resistivities require very high temperatures. Not only that, uh, in addition to temperatures, there must be another phase in the mantle, which could be hydration, so either uh, free fluids or more likely dissolved water, and or some amount of partial melt. Um, this is now three profiles, uh, pretty much along the same line that we've been looking at. This is the surface heat flow from a earlier study uh, with Roy Hindman. What it shows is that the Cordilleran region going from the volcanic arc to the Rocky Mountain Trench has very high surface heat flow, much higher than what you see in the Cretonic area. Based on the surface heat flow, we've estimated that the MOHO temperature is about 800 degrees C here, which is at, 80, at about 35 kilometers depth. In addition to that, the high heat flow suggests a very thin lithosphere, and our thermal calculations give a lithosphere thickness of about 60 kilometers. These two profiles are the shear wave velocity and the resistivity that we looked at previously. Um, and they're plotted here on the same line so that you can see a very good correspondence between these two completely independent data sets. We notice again that the Cordilleran mantle has low velocity and low electrical resistivity. Tai Chi Yu, as part of her PhD, has been trying to conduct a joint analysis of these two data sets to understand the physical properties of the mantle. And based on the observed values, what she's found is that the Cordilleran mantle between about 75 and 150 kilometers depth must be hot, somewhere around 1200 degrees Celsius. And in addition to that, there must be a small amount or a large amount of dissolved water within uh, the mantle. And her calculations suggest that there's more than 1500 ppm H or SI. So this is um, hydroxyls that are dissolved in olivine. If you then take that and convert it to the uh, amount of water in the peridotitic mantle, what you'd find is that there'd be more than 250 parts per million uh, H2O. Um, so what she finds is that for the most part, the combination of high temperatures and high amounts of hydration can explain the geophysical observations, uh, but there could also be a small amount of melt, um, but it's not extensive. Uh, the other things I'll point out are the uh, very strong contrast with the properties of the craton. Based on Teich's analysis, what uh, she finds is that the, these uh, values require cool and dry 
microtonic mantle with a very thick lithosphere. As I said previously, greater than a 200 kilometers thickness. And the other thing I'll point out here is the boundary between the Cordillera and Craton mantle. You'll see that in both data sets, it's almost right below the Rocky Mountain Trench. There's a very strong correlation between these two. Um, so on this slide, I should just note that the lateral resin of these two studies is, um, well, it's good, it's not great. So there's been a number of recent studies really trying to understand the structure of the transition between the Cordilla and Mantle. And what's shown here are some recent tomography images from Yunfeng Chen's work um, here at the University of Alberta. So these are uh, images of the P wave velocities and the shear wave velocities from body wave tomography. And the advantage of using body wave tomography is that you get very high neural resolution. These are the uh, anomalies in the velocities at 100 kilometers depth. This is the velocity scales shown here. And then these two are profiles taken on line A, A primed. And again, you'll see the very strong contrast between the Cordilleran mantle and the Cretonic mantle with a sharp boundary that underlies the Rocky Mountain Trench. From Yin Feng's work, what we see is that this velocity gradient occurs over a lateral distance of 50 to 100 kilometers. So this is extremely sharp. In addition to that, the boundary itself is subvertical, and there is a hint that it's actually dipping towards the west, so towards the Cordillera, um, at an angle of perhaps as much as 20 to 30 degrees. With all of those geophysical observations, we can kind of draw this schematic cross section. Um, this is uh, I guess was originally uh, proposed by Roy Hindman. So again, what we have is Cordilleran mantle that's, uh, we've got a lithosphere that's very thin with a mantle underneath that's quite hot with some amount of water in it. And then we have a sharp transition below the Rocky Mountain Trench to the Cretonic region. So therefore we have this big step lithosphere thickness. So an obvious question is how did this step actually form? And there's two end matter hypotheses for this. Uh, the first is that this is a very long lived structure that's inherited from previous events um, that marked growth of the Cordillera as uh, it was accreted to the east, uh, western side of the Craton. So, one idea would be that uh, we had rifting of the Craton, um, so and supercontinent rifting followed by uh, the accretion of the Cordillera through east-directed subduction. And therefore, in this hypothesis, then um, this uh, step would have been formed through this rifting followed by um, subduction and accretion phase. And based on the timing, that would suggest that the step is a long-lived feature with, that was formed more than 100 million years ago, and perhaps much longer than that. Um, and then Roy Hindman has put forward the hypothesis that the present day high temperatures in the Cordilleran region may be associated with a small scale convection that's um, induced by the fact that we've got hydration from the nearby subduction zone. I'll just mention one other uh, hypothesis in terms of a long lived structure. Uh, the one that I've discussed here calls for continual east-directed subduction. Um, there's also an idea that actually the accretion wasn't through continual east-directed subduction. And in fact, the Cordilleran region represents a rib continent. And perhaps um, there was a period of west-directed subduction below the eastern margin of the Cordillera. This is shown some numeric models by a former master's student, Wen Bo Zhang, who uh, worked with Stephen Johnston and I. What we have here is the Craton, which was inferred to have been separated by an ocean basin from the Cordillera, where we had subduction towards the west below the eastern side of the Cordillera. And you can see over time the ocean basin closes so that we form a suture and then the subducted plate breaks off. And so the hypothesis here is that perhaps that is what formed the step. Based on the timing of magmatism in the Cordillera, as well as uh, some other geophysical, uh, geological observations, here the step would have been created at about 95 million years ago. The contrasting idea 
is that the step was actually formed more recently than that, um, so that it is a more short-lived feature. So in this kind of n-member hypothesis, what we have is juxtaposition of the Cordillera and Craton lithospheres through some kind of accretion process, perhaps with strike-slip ocean. And then we have thinning of the Cordillera and lithosphere. And there's sort of two ideas for this. One is that there's gradual thinning through kind of small scale drips, perhaps because this material becomes hydrated and therefore is weak enough to drip. Um, or that we have wholesale delamination where the block of the lower lithosphere falls off. Um, with the dripping, um, this is a gradual process. Um, but in order for this to explain the step, we wouldn't have to have a contrast between the Cordilleran mantle and the Cretonic mantle such that it does not undergo kind of this erosion. So we have to have a, a crown that's resistant to erosion. In terms of the wholesale delamination, um, then the step would mark the eastern limit of the delaminated lithosphere. Abau et al. in 2014 proposed that this, is might, this might have occurred below the southern Canadian Cordillera. This is based on observations of uh, constructions of surface topography, as well as uh, images from uh, seismic tomography. And they proposed that this delamination event in the south happened about 55 million years ago. So uh, stepping back, this is now the view we have of the future. So as I've said, there's a lot of geophysical data to suggest this strong contrast in structure um, and therefore a contrast in lithosphere thickness. Um, and the main thing is that we have a very sharp step in the lithosphere thickness. And as I mentioned, there is some question about the dip direction and perhaps it's vertical or even dipping towards the west. Uh, based on uh, the different hypotheses that I just went through, um, it's believed that this step has been in place for a long time for the Southern Cordillera, at least 50 million years and perhaps much longer than that. Uh, so as a geodynamicist, this is actually quite um, intriguing because we have strongly contrasting mantles here. Um, and if you've done any kind of mantle convection models, what you know is that the mantle doesn't like to have strong contrast. We'll have, it will actually try to uh, smooth things out. Um, so I became interested in trying to understand exactly uh, what does this strong contrast tell us about the mantle in this area. So for the next few slides, I'd like to show some numerical models um, that we've done to actually understand the dynamics of the mantle at the lithosphere step. Uh, these models were done by Deirdre Leon as part of her master's thesis. Um, here at the University of Alberta. So the models themselves are two-dimensional models uh, where we solve for the uh, thermal and mechanical evolution of our lithosphere mantle system. They are using the SOPAL code, uh, which is finite element code from uh, Dalhousie Geodynamics Group, uh, from Chris Beaumont and uh, Philippe Filsack and a number of others who've contributed to the code. Uh, Deirdre set up the models so that we have a very large model domain because we didn't want the boundaries to interfere with the dynamics. So the height of the models is uh, 900 kilometers, width is 2400 kilometers. We have two lithospheres. Uh, we have a Cordilleran lithosphere that's 60 kilometers thick and a Craton lithosphere. We use the thickness of 250 kilometers. Um, in each of these regions, we have an upper crust and a lower crust, and then the green indicates mantle lithosphere. We set up the most so that we have an initially vertical step, and then we're going to see how that step evolves as a function of time. The dynamics of this depend very strongly on what you do with the properties of the mantle. So for the sublithospheric mantle, what we are doing is assuming a density that's consistent kind of primitive mantle. It is temperature dependent. Um, so as the temperature goes up, the density goes down. We also use a rheology based on a wet olivine using the parameters from Hearth and Kolstedt. Uh, this flow law has a term for water content. For, so I'm going to use a water content of 2,500 ppm H over SI. Um, this is motivated by uh, some of Taichi Yu's work that shows that the mantle appears to be very hydrated in this area. 
For the first model that I show, the cratonic mantle lithosphere is going to have properties that are somewhat different than the sublithospheric mantle. Specifically, we're going to use a depleted composition. And to us, what that means is that the density is a little bit less than the underlying mantle when it's at the mantles are at the same temperature. So in this model, it's 30 kilograms per cubic meter less dense. I'm also going to assume that this mantle is dry and therefore it's strong. And so just for simplicity, we're going to use a viscosity that's 10 times higher than sublithospheric mantle. Um, so what we do is we start the models with this and then we just sit and watch and see what they do over time. I'm gonna show some model plots and they're really focusing on the central area of the models so we can see this step nicely. Uh, the first model that I've show, I'm showing here is uh, a conductive model. Basically what we've done is we've turned off convection. So we're, we're getting rid of any density variations that might drive fluid motion. And we're just solving for the thermal evolution. I'm just showing this to show you what happens if you, you place a hot thin lithosphere next to a cool thick lithosphere. What's going to happen is the hot lithosphere cools over time as heat is diffusing through the system. And you'll see over 100 million years, the isotherms get more spread out below the cordilleran area as this area cools to the surface. And it is also cooling because it's sitting next to the cold craton. And so the net result of this is that our initially sharp thermal contrast becomes smoothed out very quickly. So this is very inconsistent with what we see in the geophysical data. This is now a model uh, where we allow uh, convection to occur. So we do have density variations that drive fluid flow. So again, um, what we have here is a craton that's strong and chemically depleted. The arrows are showing the flow field that's induced in the model. What you notice is that immediately the cordilleran mantle starts to convect. And I should say there's no flow being imposed anywhere else in the model. So all of this is being induced by the temperature contrast. You'll notice that we get a counter or a clockwise flow cell here. That's originating because we have cordilleran mantle that's being cooled by the adjacent craton. It becomes a little bit dense and then it sinks and then that drives flow up into the corner. You can see that over time, this flow kind of changes its pattern and it becomes really quite vigorous, sort of of order uh, 10 uh, centimeters per year. As a result of this edge driven flow, we maintain a very sharp thermal contrast over the 100 million year time frame of the models. You'll also notice that the craton gets a little bit disturbed, but it really doesn't um, you know, get uh, eroded very much. And that's because we've got the strong rheology as well as the chemical depletion, which kind of allow the craton to stay intact. Another thing um, that I'll just point out here, but you actually can't see it in the, uh, the plots, is that the edge of the craton is actually heating up a little bit. Um, because it's sitting next to this flow cell that is very high temperature. And this was also seen by Dave Eaton in some of his calculations um, a couple of years ago. I'm going to show two more models where we vary the properties of the cratonic mantle lithosphere. So uh, this model is going to be one where we're assuming a depleted composition. So we still have a mantle that's a little bit less dense than the sublithospheric mantle at the same temperature. But instead of assuming a dry rheology, we're going to give it a wet rheology. What you see is that with this set of parameters, we get very rapid destabilization of the cratonic mantle lithosphere. And in particular, the cratonic mantle lithosphere at large depth is um, only a little bit cooler than the sublithospheric mantle. So as a result of that, it has um, a lower density relative to the sublithospheric mantle. And so it actually gets extruded out to the side and then it buoyantly upwells to underplate the craton. The net result of that is that we get emplacement of uh, cratonic mantle below the cordera. In terms of the lithosphere step, you'll notice that it really smooths out that step over time. This uh, third model is going to be one where we're assuming now a dry rheology, just as in model A but we're going to get rid of the chemical depletion. 
Um, so that means that at the same temperature, there's no density difference between the cratonic mantle and the underlying sublithospheric mantle. What we see is that we have edge-driven convection, as we observed previously, but it actually involves the cratonic mantle lithosphere. This material it destabilizes and gets eroded through down wellings rather than the lateral extrusion that we saw previously. That's because this material is a little bit cooler than the underlying mantle and therefore it's a little bit denser. So it's just dripping off. And at the end of the model, what you see is that the cratonic margin is now dipping towards the craton interior. So you can see that just with um, a few variations in the properties of the cratonic mantle, we get really different dynamics that um, occur in the models. Um, the other thing um, that we've seen is that it's actually very hard to keep the craton step um, with a vertical geometry, uh, because um, as soon as you start to change the parameters, we get erosion. We then wanted to take the models and uh, see what they meant for in terms of the seismic structure so that we could compare them to some of the seismic tomography images that I showed previously. So what we've done is taken the numerical models and converted them to shear wave velocity based on the temperature, pressure, composition, and water content at each point in the mantle. So we're just going to focus on the mantle here. Um, to do this, we set up grids of the shear wave velocity as a function of temperature and depth or pressure. This is based on calculations where the anharmonic shear wave velocity comes from the perplex program. And then we apply an analytic correction based on uh, lab data from Fowler and Jackson. So this would be an example of one of our velocity grids, assuming a primitive mantle composition that's hydrated. So you can see these are the predicted variations in shear wave velocity. So we then take this and we're able to calculate the shear wave velocity structure of the models. So this is now our reference model, which is our successful model for a stable craton margin, where our craton is both strong and depleted. And you'll see that that sharp thermal contrast that we saw previously maps into a sharp shear wave velocity contrast. And you'll see in the shear waves, we maintain a subvertical cratonic margin um, with a very high lateral gradient. And that is underlying the initial position of the craton margin. For comparison, this is the model where our craton was weak and depleted, so it extruded sideways. The result of that is that we reduce the lateral velocity gradient. And in addition, the edge of the craton migrates towards the west, and we end up with a margin that dips towards the craton. Then this is now the, the predicted velocities for the uh, model with the strong and undepleted craton. Due to the erosion and downwellings at the edge of the craton, we end up with a very sharp velocity contrast because we're putting hot material right next to very cold material. Uh, but the margin itself forms a dipping structure towards the craton and the erosion is eating its way into the craton. So the margin is migrating east. Based on these, we can then compare back to the observations. And this is one that looks more like what the seismologists see in their tomography models. Um, so just so uh, we can compare this a little bit more uh, quantitatively, uh, what I've done here, this is our reference model, um, and I've just plotted the shear wave velocities as a function of distance at 150 kilometers depth. And again, uh, what you'll see is that over the 100 million year model run, we maintain a very high velocity gradient over a horizontal distance of about 100 kilometers. Um, you can also see uh, this change in the craton velocities. That's that um, conductive heating that I was mentioning a bit earlier. Um, just for comparison, these are the shear wave velocities from Yunfeng Chen's model. And you can see that we actually have a fairly good match between uh, the Cordilleran and craton velocities in terms of the absolute values. And in addition to that, we are um, seeing the gradient over the same uh, lateral distance that Yunfeng sees in his tomography. Uh, just a few more models. Um, one of the, I guess, simplifications in the previous models is that we were assuming that the mantle was stationary. Um, so all the flow that we was, were seeing was uh, from the edge of the craton inducing flow. 
What we've done in these two models is imposed a lateral mantle flow. Um, so this has got the craton with our kind of our stable craton parameters, so a strong and depleted craton. In this model, we have a mantle flow that's imposed at four centimeters a year. What you see is that with that flow, we can maintain a fairly nice uh, lithosphere step, but we do get some displacement of the edge of the craton so that we get a little bit of thickening below the craton edge. In contrast, if we impose flow in the other direction, it entrains the lowermost part of the craton, and so we get a little bit of displacement of the craton margin um, at the edge here. And these are now the shear wave velocities. This is kind of our reference model that we've been looking at, and then these are two models with our mantle flows. And so you'll see from this that with mantle flow towards the craton, we get that thickening of the craton lithosphere with the flow in the other direction, then that helps us maintain um, a vertical boundary and perhaps one that's dipping towards the west. So thinking back to Yunfeng Chen's uh, images, if we have a vertical to west dipping margin, then either this model or one where the mantle flow is towards the west uh, would be good candidates uh, for understanding that. Um, so this is just a summary slide basically saying that, so there's Yunfeng's model and there's um, one of the models with our four centimeter year mantle flow. Um, so the conclusions from this set of models is that if this is a step that's been in place for at least 50 million years, then that's telling us that this cratonic mantle must be quite strong as well as chemically depleted um, so that we can maintain that lateral uh, temperature gradient and uh, lateral gradient and geophysical properties. Um, the other thing um, is that we do get quite a lot of mantle flow uh, that's occurring at that step, and that helps to maintain that temperature gradient. Uh, so that's uh, a few of our results for the southern part of the Canadian Cordillera. Uh, for the last few minutes, I'd like to present some ongoing work in the northern part of the Canadian Cordillera. Um, so as I pointed out earlier, this is an area where we have a lot of volcanism in the northern Cordillera volcanic province. So in the next map, we will take a look at that a little bit more closely, as shown here. Um, so the red triangles and the orange triangles are volcanoes of the northern Cordillera volcanic province. They're color coded by age. Um, and specifically, I just want to point out of the yellows and oranges, those are the oldest volcanoes, um, according to the dating that's been done. These have an age of somewhere around between 10 and maybe as much as 20 million years. So they are concentrated on the west. And then all of these other volcanoes tend to be somewhat younger than that, uh, less than 10 million years. So this is a very uh, young volcanic field. Um, the compositions in the volcanic field are alkali olivine basalts, mostly. So that's indicating mantle melts. And of course, um, the common hypothesis for this is that perhaps this is reflecting a slab window that formed below this area as subduction got shut off. Another observation I'll point out on this map are the white dots. Those are earthquakes that are magnitude three and greater at depths less than 30 kilometers. So they're crustal earthquakes. We see a lot of earthquakes in this region. This is associated with the Yakutat block collision and kind of plate margin interactions. We have kind of sporadic seismicity across the Cordillera, and then we have a concentration of earthquakes on the Eastern side in the Mackenzie Mountains region. Um, looking at the focal mechanisms of those earthquakes, we see that they are thrust fault mechanisms, which is indicating a compression across here. One uh, model to explain that is that these may be associated with compression that's induced by the Yakutat collision. So we have collision of a big, uh, thick oceanic plateau here, and the stresses are being transmitted across the Cordillera into the Mackenzie Mountains. Um, one thing that's kind of been puzzling to me about that is that we have the Cordillera in between the collision and the Mackenzie Mountains. As we've seen, the Cordillera is very hot and weak. Um, so it's unclear about uh, the, whether that will allow stresses to be transmitted. Uh, Stefan Mazzotti has done some calculations of this and he proposes that perhaps if the lower crust is weak enough, then it allows the upper crust to slide laterally to transmit those stresses.
Uh, for our study, we want to ignore the plate boundary processes and just look at the lithosphere dynamics to see if we can explain some of these observations just with lithosphere dynamics in this area. To do that, um, we've been working with um, Pascal Laudette and uh, Andrew Schaefer. Um, these are uh, some Pascal's uh, receiver function images. They're along a line shown here, B to B primed. So these are showing uh, where there are interfaces or impedance contrasts in the subsurface. Along that line, what we see is this big pulse of energy, which is indicating a downward increase in velocity. So it's a positive receiver function. This is interpreted to be the moho, the base of the crust. You'll notice that this is occurring at a depth of about 35 kilometers and it's very, very flat. Just below that, you see this pulse of energy. This is indicating a downward decrease in seismic velocity. And this was interpreted to indicate the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. And if you measure the distance between the moho and that feature, which is shown down here, what we would find is that the mantle lithosphere is only 15 kilometers thick. So that gives an entire lithosphere thickness of about 50 kilometers. This is again, consistent with the idea that the cordilleran lithosphere is thin and very hot. The other intriguing thing that uh, is uncovered in the receiver functions is this structure in the mantle. Um, it looks like there's some sort of west dipping structure down here. Um, and for comparison, this is now Andrew Schaefer's uh, shear wave velocities across the same, along the same profile. And so we see the cordilleran mantle and the cratonic mantle. And the boundary between those also appears to have the same dip and positioning as this receiver function um, image. So motivated by these observations, um, we've been testing the idea that perhaps this is a signature of delamination below the Northern Cordillera. Um, so here's just a schematic diagram from Pascal's paper. So the observations tell us that the Cordillera is thin and hot, and we've got thick, cool craton. We can go back to the same arguments. Is this a long-lived feature? Is it more short-lived? And we're testing the idea that it's short-lived and specifically that we had a delamination event where we had cordillera and lithosphere peeling away, creating the west dipping mantle structure. With this process, then you would create thin lithosphere. You'd also heat up the cordillera so you get high surface heat flow. And in addition, you might induce magmatism, which could perhaps explain the Northern Cordillera volcanic province. So I'm going to show one numerical model where we're trying to model this process. Basically, um, what we're going to do is start with the idea that there was delamination. We'll set up a model that creates delamination, and then we can look at some of the predictions from that model um, to see how they compare with uh, geological and geophysical observations. Uh, so this is a model that was done by Tai Chi Yu. Again, this is using the SOPAL code to look at the two-dimensional thermal mechanical evolution. This is the overall model geometry. So it's 2000 kilometers wide and 660 kilometers deep. We're really interested in the central part of the model where we're going to focus on the continental lithosphere. Um, so you'll notice we don't have any plate boundaries in this model. We just want to look at the lithosphere dynamics and what they mean for the surface observations. Um, so there's a lot of details that go into these models. Um, we do have a uh, crust, so an upper and a lower crust, and then the gray regions are mantle lithosphere. Um, if the materials that we're using have a viscous plastic rheology and a temperature dependent density, um, if you have questions about them, I would be happy to talk with you about that later. Okay. Um, but what I'm just going to focus on is just the overall structure that we're using to, again, show you a model that does have delamination. The initial structure um, is made up of the cratonic region over here in the dark gray. We have a kind of a variation in lithosphere thickness. This is inspired by Andrew Schaefer's tomography models that shows that there seems to be a deepening of the craton LAB as you move east across this area. And then to the west of that, we have the cordilleran lithosphere. And then we just have a very large piece here just to put the boundary far away from the area that we're interested in. In this model, um, what we're going to do is look at how um, the cordilleran 
region may respond to an episode of delamination. So to induce delamination, what we need are two ingredients. First of all, you need a, a weak layer in, within the lithosphere that will allow decoupling to occur. And then we also need a zone that connects that weak layer to the convecting mantle. So in the model that I'm going to show you, what we're doing is assuming that we had an earlier thickening event that created 60 kilometer thick cordilleran crust. With a 60 kilometer crust, you actually put the lower part of the crust into the eclogite stability field. And so that um, occurs below a depth of about 45 kilometers. So in this model, the dark blue is showing the crust that's going to start off as being eclogitized and therefore it's going to have a high density. We also impose a weak zone to create that conduit to trigger delamination. And in this particular model, that weak zone perhaps could uh, represent an inherited structure such as an old suture zone. It could also be an old volcanic arc from an earlier episode of subduction. Okay, we're not um, trying to uh, model that process in detail. We're just imposing a weak zone. So I'm going to show the model evolution. This is going to occur over 40 million years. The time is at the top. This is the whole model domain down here. This is going to show an animation and the lines are the temperature contours. The upper plot, plot shows the surface heat flow that's predicted by the model. And this is the surface elevation. And these are going to change over time. So I'll just uh, play this movie. What we see is that we have some adjustment of the craton, the weak zone drips away, and then that opens a conduit that allows delamination to initiate, um, where we have the eclogitized lower crust peeling away and taking the mantle lithosphere with it. So you can see that through this process, then we remove all the original mantle lithosphere as well as the lower crust in this area. So we're left with a thin lithosphere that's hot, which also then results in an increase in surface heat flow as well as surface elevation. Let's play that movie again so we can see the dynamics a little bit more. Okay, so we have this weak zone initially just drips away. There's the conduit that initiates the delamination. The pink colors are where the sublithospheric mantle is above the solidus temperature. So this is where some partial melt may form. And you'll notice then as a result of the delamination, we have uplift and you might've seen that it propagated kind of across the model with the delaminating slab. And we also had an increase in the surface heat flow. So we can then compare the model predictions to um, observations to just basically see um, how we're doing. So these are just snapshots from the model, again, showing this initial kind of opening of a conduit and then a triggering of delamination. What we see is the melting, which is shown in the pink, starts over on this side and then it spreads across the whole width of the delaminated region. In addition to that, we have heating of the lithosphere that also moves across the model. So therefore, with delamination, we have thinning of the lithosphere and an eastward progression of heating. Uh, this is reflected in uh, the model surface heat flow and the model MOHO temperature. So each of these lines are the, in this plot, the MOHO temperature as a function of time at different distances across the model. So 700, 800, 900. And what you see is this kind of eastward pro progression of the delamination. The main thing to take away from this is that the MOHO temperature um, increases immediately uh, because you're up in placing very hot mantle right below the crust with delamination. The surface heat flow also increases with time. Um, the, this model where it uses the thermal parameters of uh, Trevor Lewis, which has very high radiogenic heat in the crust. So that's why it starts off with a high heat flow. And then you'll see this increase in heat flow over time. Um, and that is as uh, the thermal pulse then makes its way to the surface. And again, you see the eastward progression. Um, so th these initial models suggest that perhaps delamination is a way to explain kind of the thin lithosphere and the high temperatures that are observed um, in this area. 
Um, on this slide, we're just uh, looking at a couple of other observations. Um, I pointed out the melting of the mantle in this model. This is now a distance time plot. So what this is showing is distance across the model for each model time going from the start of the model to 40 million years. The gray circles indicate if there is any partial melt below that horizontal position in the model. And so what we see is that initially there's no melt anywhere in the model, just as we see up here. And then as we have this sort of initiation of delamination, we get melting occurring below there, and then the melting spreads across the entire width of the Cordillera as the delamination proceeds. And this model would predict that the melting would last for about 25 million years after the start of delamination. So if we compare this and we uh, make the um, hypothesis that the Northern Cordillera Volcanic Province perhaps reflects this mantle melting, we can then use the ages of the NCVP to tie our models to geological time. And so as I said previously, the onset of NCVP magmatism was somewhere around 15 million years. So if we say that that is 15 million years ago in geological time, then that would place um, our model time of about 5 million years at that geological time. And therefore moving it forward to the present day, it would suggest that a model time of 20 million years or this frame would correspond to approximately the present day. Um, and so our models do suggest that we would have ongoing melting of the mantle. Um, the other thing that's shown on this are colors. And this is basically the strain rate in the crust. What we see are areas where the crust is under extension in blue and compression in red. And what we notice is that there's actually um, some changes in the upper crustal uh, strain fields as delamination proceeds. So in particular, the delamination itself is marked by this kind of migration of extensional deformation. Um, and importantly, at present day, because of the structures that are produced, we get um, compression in this area of the model. And this coincides with the Mackenzie Mountain Belt. Um, so we're now wondering whether some of the compression that's seen um, today with those thrust fault mechanisms could perhaps be related to some of the lithosphere dynamics and lithosphere structures rather than a far field uh, stress from the Yakutat collision. Um, so sort of to sum up this part, um, what we're suggesting is perhaps delamination could have occurred below this area. This could explain a number of observations like the elevation, um, the lithosphere, the high uh, temperatures and heat flow, as well um, we could, it could explain magmatism and perhaps crustal compression. Um, this is work that's ongoing, and so we're still uh, testing some different parameters. So I definitely welcome any uh, feedback on uh, some of the model results that I've shown. Um, so I think I'm pretty much at the end of my time here. So uh, this is just a quick summary of uh, kind of the things that we've been looking at. Uh, if you take anything away from this, uh, maybe keep this image in your mind. Um, that we have a very sharp contrast in lithosphere thickness. I think that um, in terms of the seismic velocities, this is one of the highest lateral changes in seismic velocity in the mantle seen anywhere on Earth. So this is really quite intriguing. Um, and it leads to questions about how did this structure actually form? Is it long lived or is it more recent? Um, and is this structure actually stable? And by using numerical models, um, what um, hopefully I've convinced you is that we can test these hypotheses. Um, so for example, if there was recent delamination, the models make specific predictions about some of the observables that are associated with that process. Um, so those can be tested against observations. Um, and then in terms of the stability of the step, what we found is that with the models, um, most combinations of parameters do not keep the step stable. Um, it's only a very narrow range of parameters that uh, are able to maintain this structure for more than a few tens of millions of years. Um, but even a stable step can be modified over time. Um, so with that, I'll probably stop talking um, and I'd certainly welcome any uh, questions. So thank you for your attention.